You're listening to The Resilient Animal. I'm Annie Peterson, Doctor of Education with a Master's in Mental Health Recovery and Trauma-Informed Care. This podcast is an exploration of how helping other living beings can benefit mental health and what makes us all resilient animals. Welcome, everybody, to the Resilient Animal Podcast. Today, our guests are from the Kantu Foundation, Fatima Guevara, who is the founder, and Jenna Finch, who is the director of operations. Welcome, ladies, and thank you so much for being here. Hi, Annie. Thank you. So we had a really nice conversation a couple of weeks back about the foundation. And just to share a little bit, I found out about you because I was going to a spin class in San Diego. And outside of the class, I met some of your wonderful volunteers, as well as some of the dogs. And so I was hoping maybe one of you could just start, tell us a little bit about the foundation and how you two connected with each other. Yeah, I can start uh, here. The Canto Foundation is obviously, it's named after my dog, Canto. Cantu is a dog that I adopted back in 2017. Mm-hmm. He was my foster dog who I ended up adopting. I was 23 at the time and I had zero idea what I was doing in the sense of I was already a dog mom, but Cantu was a swimmer syndrome dog. So he was six months old and he had zero use of his back legs. Initially, everyone thought that with therapy, he would start to walk. Later on, we found out he was fully paralyzed. And at that point, I was already hooked. I, I love my other dogs, I do, but also having the connection of he, and it's an everyday thing, he needs me but also that I need him. I always think about if anything would ever happen to him. I don't know what my day day would be like. But anyways, just coming on back on. So I ended up adopting Kianto when he was nine months old officially. And prior to that, I started a social media page for him, for him to get adopted. His Instagram is Kianto on wheels. So I would post my day to day, but also I think a lot of our community watched me do so many like trial and errors with his wheels, with his diapers, me learning how to change his diapers, how to properly care for his legs when he was dragging himself, just trying to maneuver through what it meant to be a mom to a special needs dog. So I think that's our community set it growing. And then the dodo, we caught their attention and they did a video on him. And this was post-adoption already. And it his video just blew up completely all over social media. And I they posted it. I know that dodo was big, but I didn't know what was coming, the attention that was coming. And from having maybe think like 6,000 followers, Cantu got like overnight, it was over 50,000. And then that community kept growing. And like, again, I I adopted my first dog when I was 18. So I've always been pro-adoption, shelter. I volunteered in trips. I volunteer at the shelter. So it was pretty big for me. So having this platform and the way that social media was growing at that point and raising funds, letting people know about dogs in shelters that are dying, dogs that need surgeries and rescues that are literally ran by volunteers and are spending their day to day trying to fund these needs for these dogs and help them get adopted. We started using our platform to raise money for rescues for specific dogs. And that's actually how I met Jenna. Jenna followed Kantu on Instagram. And one day she just messaged me and said, hey, can I we rescued this dog? I'm a volunteer. Can you help me post the link so I can raise some money? And then that's how we ultimately just it snowballed into this. <laughs> Yes, I'm Jenna. I'm the director of operations, and it was, I think we're coming up on, what, our four-year anniversary, actually? But yeah, four years ago, more than that, because we were talking, Fatima and I were talking over social media, and we just created this, like, really cool friendship, but, you know, that first dog I asked her for help with, I remember, I think we raised $5,000 within three days. It was, I've never seen anything like it. And I think both of us saw the power of social media and how many people wanted to help the particular dog that I was asking about. And then I think, you know, Fatima saw the need in Mexico because I kept sending her dogs that needed help down there and the devastation that goes on down there. And it, like she said, it really just snowballed. We we found an opportunity, dogs that needed us, 
used her platform to raise money, awareness, and it just turned into the Cantu Foundation. Uh, you said when we had talked earlier, you said that you had a, you spent a lot of time in Rosarito when we, you were younger. And just some of the things that you saw in that area, which really drove you to doing rescue. Yeah, yeah. I we My family had a house down in the Rosarito area growing up. So we spent summers down there. So I think I just grew up seeing the devastation of the homeless problem with animals and just the mistreatment. No one was educated about spay and neuter. And growing up, I remember being on the beach just with, I have pictures of puppies all over me, no idea where they're coming from. Um, so I always knew it was a problem. And every time I go down there, I loved going down there, but it was heartbreaking to see. So I started um, volunteering with an organization here in San Diego, but that also focused on, um, rehabilitating and, and saving dogs off the streets of Baja. And that's how I just really focused my energy on rescue in that area. I know that it was as a rescue, it really is a, it's a passion. You're not rolling in dough. Nobody yep. is just bringing in the no. bucks. And how you're able to manage the foundation. You're in Boston, in Boston. and Jenna, you're in, over here in South, Southern California. So how does that management work? Yes. And I know you don't have a big, beautiful building here. So how do you do all the fostering? For a long time, it was just us two and maybe one or two volunteers. For so long, it was just us. In the sense of running the rest. Yes, like just everyday operations, transport, who speaks to the vets, who deals with adopters. But now I believe, and Fatima, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think we have a volunteer team of about 80 people. So like Jenna mentioned, when we first started, it was me and her and another volunteer, you know, trying to, and we had a lot of help. Like Jenna mentioned, she had a connection with a rescue here in San Diego who helped us a lot, the Animal Pad. They've yep. been doing this over 15 years. Uh, Stephanie Nissan and Lauren are one of, like, we, we looked up to, like, their rescue and kind of structure our rescue, like, after them okay. in a sense of how they organize their adoptions teams. We saw their foster program, and a lot of it came from learning and reading, and but also our experience as volunteers and what we wanted to see in our rescue. But, yeah, it literally it grew from us to building a foster team and adoptions team. Then our vetting team, our transport team, and uh, because we're a foster based rescue, we don't have a, an actual building here in San, like in San Diego, a sanctuary like we do in Mexico, right? And then it snowballed into the events team. Truly, I think the events team was like a pivot pitiful moment yep. for a rescue when it came to having the exposure that we needed in San Diego. Mm -hmm. Social media, people knew about us in Colorado, right? In New York, they knew about us because it was social media, but getting our foot our feet on the ground running in San Diego was our events team that has Sara Rodriguez that has, we have a lot, another Sarah. they truly went down and they started speaking to businesses, telling them about our rescue, what we wanted, the need that we needed and, and businesses just started rolling in. We started actually coming up with an event calendar. We started getting volunteers because we needed volunteers to set up, take everything down, watch the puppies, interact with potential adopters. And after that, it truly took off when it came to volunteering. And what's different because a lot of our adoptions and, and any like remote role, like adoptions and they are mainly remote in a, sen in a sense of we have people in New York, we have people in Texas. So our community was very widespread, but once the events team and people from San Diego were seeing the impact that they were making, they just started signing up more and we started building a more tight-knit community. Don't get me wrong, our community with our remote volunteers is great. We literally talk to them on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, but and having people on the ground and running and talking about us in San Diego is amazing. That was the hardest thing to do. But it's pretty amazing with all these remote volunteers. Our foster director, Emily, she has never once met any of us in person, has never once met any of the dogs that we save every day in person. But her like passion, her drive is so extreme so it's so cool to see these volunteers that they don't get to see it in person but yet they work so hard every day all day to get this done yeah and so i so fatima i was going to say there's definitely something to be said when you were saying that 
the tight knit community and having everyone in one place, it really does make a difference. And I think that for, and I think that quite often generationally, I'm not that I'm going off on a tangent, but I think it's harder for people of maybe my, even my generation to really have that connection remotely. And so it's nice yep. that it's, it sounds like it's maybe even a little more inclusive in terms of people who are older, who can be there and be involved. But then what Jenna yes. was saying about people not meeting each other, but still being able to, yep. to give back and be just as productive. I quite frankly yep. love remote stuff, but that's just me. And if you think about it, social media plays such a huge aspect because all of our remote volunteers are literally, they found us through social media yep. and they weren't even become part of it. That's how big, so what, what a huge, apart from like the funding and fundraising, mm -hmm. Social media plays such a huge role on people finding out about us in Texas. And literally, there's so many rescues out there, don't get me wrong. But like they made an actual connection through us, through yeah. our storytelling on social media, how we rescued, who we rescued, what we did after we rescued. And, mm -hmm. and it was so nice to see that they chose us to volunteer. With. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I mean, we may have discussed this when we were having our phone conversation. Social media can be not good, but I think that yeah. there are so many positives to it. There are people that I know I'm connecting with that I probably wouldn't have been able to had it not been for Instagram, had it not been for Facebook, had it, and you're getting the word out. And I think we're just becoming, it's just so much more global, global understanding. Without social media, this would honestly never have even started. That's how it started. That's how we raised awareness for every single dog that we've rescued, the funds, the volunteers, the adopters, the fosters. Like I, it, for social media, at least from a nonprofit standpoint, there's only positives that come from it. And we're so grateful. Absolutely. Fatima, I was hoping you might mm -hmm. talk a little bit, you said you grew up in uh, Lima and maybe talk a little bit about what your experiences were were in Peru, if you would like to, or, and yeah. then just how that kind of brought you to where you are today too. Yeah. I grew up in Peru. I moved here when I was nine, but obviously in Peru, you see as much and probably worse devastation than you see in Mexico when it comes mm -hmm. to dogs. Luckily, I grew up in a family that if they saw a stray dog or a dog that was hungry, they never looked away. They never told me not to pick it up and hug it because I may get fleas on me. It was always a very positive, let's go help this dog type of scenario when it came to my mom. And um, my grandma would live in a very small town, like three hours away from the capital. So we would constantly see dogs, you know, on the road, hungry, or get hit by a car or puppies, piles of puppies. And she will never, my grandma didn't let me bring in the home, but while I was in her house, she would let me set up a little home for them outside. And she she would let me take him to the vet and she would let me feed them. And then she, and then I would, since I was little, I've always been very outspoken. If I didn't like something, I would tell you right away. And they knew me as someone that would go around the town looking for homes for these puppies <laughs> and for them and how we can help them. And once the summer ended and I went, I had to go back to Lima, which is the capital, my grandma would send me follow-ups on the family about them. And I loved it. I loved it so much. The money they would give me to buy candy, I would buy dog food with. So it's, I think it's just been since I, just like Jenna, since we were were younger our parents just exposed us to that mm -hmm. and, and let us run with it however we wanted to so that translated here I moved here I moved to Boston with my family and I was nine and we brought a dog from our dog from Peru mm -hmm. <laughs> we you know if we're coming everybody's coming and <laughs> her name was Candy she was our first family dog this beautiful yellow lab um and she came here and we I literally I grew up with her my mom considered her my sister her birthday was a week before my birthday, and I will always <laughs> her balloons. Her birthday balloons were passed down to me because my birthday was seven <laughs> days after. How old are they now? You're gonna have household. I remember when I was 13. There's a video of everyone saying happy birthday, and when the point that said happy birthday, Fatima, my mom would say happy birthday, Candy, by accident all the time. <laughs> so that was a full dynamic in my household. Um, <laughs> so when I was 18, I adopted my first dog, Jax. And this, I was 18, he was three months old and I was still living with my mom and he just became a whole mm. world. And uh, as an 18 year old, would we adopt to an 18 year old that doesn't have a job and is going to school and 
supported by your parents? Probably not. But I always tell John, I'm like, some people are cut from the mm-hmm. same paper. And I was cut from those piece, same piece of paper. Never in the 12 years that I've had my dog have I ever thought about rehoming right. because I will do anything before. I will go in full debt if I have to when it comes to surgeries, vetting, housing. I, I'm 31 now. I've been able I. When I we literally do everything for our dogs throughout the ten years that I've been working after college, I've tried my best to be more financially or good for me to live on my own. So my dogs have their mm-hmm. own space, not living with someone else. I may complain about them if I want to go on trips because I am still young and still live trying to live my life. I they have the best care. My mom helps us. Kianto has a, has his own dog sitter that I train, and it's just I do everything for them in every sense of the way. And it's just it's so nice to see how much I've grown up since I've had Jax, mm-hmm. twelve years that I've had him. So yeah, so our, our connection started then, and Kianto came into the picture eight years ago at this point. Uh, I also had a third dog that unfortunately passed away and he was adopted almost at the same time that Cantu was. His name was Arthur. So at one point I had three dogs in my life and it was the best time of my life, truly. Yeah. The connection I think I've had with dogs is since I grew up, but also learning how to care for them is something that I grew into as I was growing up. Yeah. And it's interesting because it's hard for people yeah, I've worked in other organizations where there was maybe a more affluent clientele who would look at people experiencing homelessness and just have a really hard time wrapping their brains around how could they have a pet? How can you know how can they do that to that dog? And uh-huh. the reality is that I'm not saying all of them, but many of those dogs were just probably more loved and more well taken care of than had they been in the typical prescribed, this is the environment that a pet should be in. They were with their person 100% of the time. And their person was also giving whatever food, whatever money, whatever, to be able to help take care of that pet. And so those are the, yeah, Yeah. you're right, Fatima, those are the people that that should really be with the animals and really help to take care of them. And it's truly the people were cut from the same paper. I think our community, I know for, I can't imagine anyone this in our community as volunteers, they would give up their dogs because of an inconvenience. Mm-hmm. And this is where there are people who were cut from the same piece of paper. And there are people that are not. And that's something we're also learning how to deal with. And we're hoping that any applicant that comes through, we're hoping they're cut from the same piece of paper. But we're learning. It's a learning curve. Right. Yeah, that's tough. It's tough to, especially when you're, And maybe you can share a little bit about that, both of you, is just after spending so much time fostering these dogs and some that may have come in with some really major medical issues, how, what is it like for you to then pass them on to a a family or a person? And just what is that like for you during that process? I think we've really refined our adoption process. It's, we're all learning. This is very new. Fatima and I have never done this before because unfortunately we have sometimes adopted out to the wrong people that their intentions were good to start, but we've had a lot of relinquishments and a really a lot of sad situations. So we are, are pretty strict on our adoption application and some adopters really don't like that and we've lost adopters over it, but we are very proud of our adoption application, our process. Process. We do full home checks, references checks, vet checks, meet and greets with every single person in the family. We have a pretty extensive adoption application. So we try really hard to match the right family with the right dog. So that is truly their forever right. home. But we also make it very clear, even though we may not agree with it, if something were to happen where they cannot keep that dog, they have to relinquish the dog back to us. We do not want to see that dog in another shelter with a family that may not be a great family. So I think we've really streamlined our process as best as we can because at the end of the day, we only have so much control. But I know we're very proud of our adoptions team, our our process, and we try really hard and and we're very picky with it as we should be. And I was going to say, I've talked to a lot of different people in a lot of different groups, and I'm so happy to see that those adoption processes are extensive. And 
not to sound flip, and this is just me, this isn't coming mm-hmm. from Fatima and Jenna, but if you think yeah. the adoption process is hard too bad, <laughs> really, exactly. you know, exactly. it, it's not, it's yeah. not for y- the person's convenience. It, yeah. it, those processes are created to support the animal's entire life. And yep. if somebody wants quick and easy, unfortunately, then they're going to go to a breeder or yep. something like that. But you're doing what's best for the animal. And that's why these organizations exist. It's not to make yep. any kind of sale or yep. anything like that. Yeah. Yep. We've had people email us saying, like, your process yep. is too long. I'm just going to go to a breeder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, true. Um, here's, unless you're like, a uh, volunteer for a rescue or you are you are in the rescue world literally like deep in you don't really see how much goes like behind the scenes in a sense of how many people that are tr- truly just like volunteers they don't make any money they don't make n- anything how many people are involved in one rescue alone it's pretty amazing even at adoption events like we never give a dog away at an event mm-hmm. and we have been mm-hmm. at events where people get very angry about mm-hmm. that but it gives us a good sense of character of who that person is they don't respect our process and our intentions will always a hundred percent be about the dogs right. and if someone is going to not respect our process then uh, transparently we don't want to adopt out to them Mm -hmm. yeah and i know you were in the middle of saying something fatima but there's another group that did i almost said session (laughs) i did an episode (laughs) and they have small dogs but they also primarily not primarily but they have a lot of reptiles and they have the same policies they do not send home Mm -hmm. at an adoption event so unless it's somebody who they've gone already gone through the entire process, they've already been approved for adoption, they just need to meet that person and it happens to be at the yep. event. But they same thing because and they yep. do not want people and especially because some of the reptiles they have are pretty exotic and would cost mm-hmm. hundreds and hundreds of dollars at a pet store. And they're just wanting to cover the cost of medical or cover the cost of housing for these reptiles. And they know they're going to get a lot of people who are are looking for the, I don't know, the ego factor or whatever. Look at this Uh, really exotic whatever that I have. And that's not who they want to adopt to. Just giving you an example, we just rescued three dogs um, in Mexico. They were abandoned by their family when the family moved out. The landlord came in, saw them. They've been there for two weeks, and the landlord was threatening to to just let them go. Yeah. So let's just think about it that way. As like literally our last rescue, how many people are involved? Um, so we had the volunteer that told us about them, the volunteer that transported them to the vet, the volunteer that's going to take care of them in Mexico until they cross, the volunteer that walks and the volunteer that shower them. Then when they come here, it's the volunteer that trans- the transports them, the volunteer that uh, takes them in. Then the volunteer that may take them to adoption events if the foster can. Then also the vetting process of the foster that took her in. We have the director that makes a mm-hmm. communication the volunteer that processes the application. Then us that we establish that communication with them. So it's like you mentioned, like how hard is it? Like this is for dogs that are healthy. They're tiny, healthy, mm-hmm. but they were abandoned, right? We're talking, and then if we're talking about a dog that was literally beaten to the ground, and you could see every bone in their body, and they've gone through a full like transformation, physically, sometimes mentally, it takes it a little bit longer to adopt out. What that means, like that, that's something like a question that you ask: How hard is it to adopt mm-hmm. out a dog that you've literally? He literally risen from like almost being dead mm-hmm. to being adopted. Our adoption process is seen whether you know that tiny, happy, healthy dog that got 20 applications and that was literally probably dropped off in front of us compared to a dog that we had to go and rescue because they were dying the process is the same for both of them but one one sometimes one is more meaningful than the other and i I think i hope hopefully i'm answering your question when it comes to our adoption process has been changed because it wasn't like this from the beginning i think the one thing that i've made sure to change our processes as we grow our team is properly trained um and you know if you don't have the time it's completely fine i always tell our adoption team 
that if they ever don't have the time or they ever feel like they can't, to just let me know because I prefer having three people in that team than having 10 people that are doing mediocre work. Yeah. But again, our process is literally the same for everything. But watching those dogs that didn't have the chance and somehow cross paths with us is really so mean. Right. Yeah. And now, so, and I think we talked about this um, earlier too. It's just with, during COVID, everybody, all the shelters were cleared out and everybody had pets and everybody wanted to do all of these. They were working remotely, working from home and they had pets and now everybody's getting completely overcrowded again. And something that yeah. sticks out in my mind was even when you were saying in, in Peru, you'd see piles of puppies and when it still continues and continues. And even with the decades that I've worked in animal welfare and I've done the education about adoption and the benefit for the animal and benefit for a person and all of that, what? It, but yet the cycle continues. <laughs> and so what do you... There is, I wish there was an easy answer to this, but what do you do to get people, maybe not current adopters, but just the public in general to understand how important it is to go to I mean, a shelter or, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Jenna. That's the hardest part. And it's, the laws obviously need to crack down on backyard breeders in general. People that are still breeding pit bulls, for example, I truly can't wrap my brain around because you go to the shelter and it's primarily pit bulls. Yeah. And, but I also think, and Fatima and I had a big conversation about this and, you know, I'm not going to talk badly about any rescue because any rescue that's out there advocating for dogs, like I fully respect, but there are rescues that don't put in the work to do the background checks to ensure that adopter is right. And then that's where people get overwhelmed. It's not the right match. And that's where the dog ends up in the shelter. So I truly think, because we th there's only so much control we can have with these backyard breeders. But with the rescues, if I've had people tell me they have two other dogs in the home, they'll go to a shelter, they don't even require them to do a meet and greet. And so you're setting that dog up and every other dog in your home for failure. So the dog winds up back in the shelter and it's just vicious cycle. I truly think the educational part of it, of what these rescues and shelters need to do to ensure the lifelong home this dog goes into, I, that has to be where it starts. Yeah, we are fully aware on the resources. Of course. They're also, they're so full right now. Yep. So when a family comes in with great intentions, yep. they have a seven, a 15 year old dog at home that probably has never been around another dog. And this family is, we want to adopt a puppy and the resources are not great. And they have a volunteer or a worker that's been there 10 hours and they get this application of a family that one, the mom works remotely, that works. The kids go to school and they're going to be home for the summer. In theory, it sounds great. And they're like, here's this puppy. And then that puppy goes home and then that puppy, and when Jenna gives, uh, just some background on Jenna, she's a dog behavioralist. So I think a, a lot of our rules and, and guidelines when it comes to adopting are literally stemmed from what she knows and what she does on a daily basis. But that puppy that, that is coming out of the shelter, hasn't met the dog, is going to come in. That puppy's going to grow up. That puppy's going to, what if it takes a an alpha role and attacks the other the, the mm -hmm. dog in the home? And then the, the mom is overwhelmed. She's working remote. The kids are back in school. And all of a sudden, we have an eight-month-old puppy that probably hasn't been properly trained back in the shelter. And then that puppy it became reactive after attacking another dog, becoming least reactive because there wasn't enough time. And then that puppy is suddenly one years old, 65 pounds, and it's being reactive at the shelter because it's a stressful environment. And then what happens? It is and we get it. Not all rescues will have the resources, yeah. but it's also about prioritizing mm -hmm. yeah. quality business quantity. Right, right. right. Yeah, yeah, completely agreed. I, 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 always, I always tell Jenna, I'm like, I, we don't have to scale up from where we are. Yeah. We are right now average rescuing three to 500 dogs a year. And that is, we're leaving our mark with mm -hmm. our one team. Apart from that, we're starting a spay and neuter program in, in Mexico where we're trying to spay 30 dogs a month. So we're also trying, as much as we're rescuing, we're trying to, I don't know, in a huge fire, where instead of a little bucket, you know, <laughs> a of water, trying mm -hmm. to you know, reduce that fire. But 
I think educating, like Jenna said, like any, if there's any rescue out there, taking dogs and then help advocating for them, that that's the first step. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Also prioritize that process. We, we're go, we, we go to events, yearly events, where it's like a ton of rescues come in to the same area. And there's rescues that are just giving out dogs to mm-hmm. families that same day. Mm-hmm. And it's always shocking for us because if you have a, a five-year-old daughter that's like, she's overwhelmed with so many cute puppies and they come to our area where we're like, this is a puppy, this is the background and you have to submit an application and then we'll process, uh, you'll meet again, we'll process in three to four days. Mm -hmm. Um, We'll send you a contract that you have to read through, you have to sign and then you have to pay the adoption fee compared to the child, the the same child that just went to their rescue that's willing to give them a cute puppy too. Most of the time it's gonna gonna go that right? So it is frustrating in our part, but we do see a lot of rescues that are also doing what we do, yeah. which I think it's a great foundation to start off of. Sometimes having those conversations with those people is the toughest, mm-hmm. it's a tougher conversation. And I'm usually the one that has to do it, where we're saying you're a great family, but this is the reasons why we can't adopt out. And yeah. it's just not fair. And it's mainly like the dogs that are at home. If you, have, if you have a senior dog that's 15 and you've had him since he was younger, bringing the puppy energy into the home might not, it, no. most of the time it doesn't work out. And that's okay. But then this is where we have to step in and say, hey, this is what we see. This is from our experiences. This is why we don't think it's going to work. Right, right. Yeah. And there are people that email us. They're like, hey, can I can I meet the dog before submitting an adoption mm-hmm. application? And I literally have a template <laughs> saved where I copy and paste and I go into a whole deal that we're not just trying to see if the dog's a match for you. Right. We're trying to see if you are a match. Really? People are always like, I've, I've refined this email to the T <laughs> because I send it out so much that I literally just break down why this is so important. Mm-hmm. And if an, if, a, if a 15 to 20 minute adoption application is too much God. for you, mm-hmm. a new dog or a dog's not going to work. Yeah. If that's the least effort you're trying to put prior. Yeah, if they can't, and this is what we were talking about earlier, if they can't put the commitment into the adoption process, then how are they going to put a commitment into taking care of that dog? And so you only, you not only, but... <laughs> Your uh, foundation is 100% dogs. And let me go ahead and start with Jenna. Can you go ahead and share a yep. just a, a profound story with us? Something that really has made an impact on you with just in your work with animals. Again, like you said, there's so many. So it's hard to pick the right one. But there was this that we named Pearl from a very bad situation out in Ensenada at a shelter that was just corrupt, the most disgusting thing you could ever imagine. But she was kept in a teeny, teeny little crate stacked on top of other dogs and other crates with other dogs on top of her. And she was blind. And the shelter staff told us she was extremely aggressive towards other dogs. She was older. And I think Fatima and I saw her and we were like, we have to take a chance on this dog. Even if she is the most dog aggressive dog, a blind older dog cannot live in this environment. It is, it's, it was horrific. We took her, she, she got all the medical care she needed. She was the biggest love bug you could ever imagine. She got adopted, actually her foster adopted her in Orange County into this amazing family where they had a little boy and we learned very quickly she wasn't dog aggressive. She couldn't see. And she had no idea the dogs coming into her space and she was vulnerable and scared and nervous and anxious. And they send us videos and photos all the time of her playing with puppies, walking Mm -hmm. with other dogs. And I think it was just one of those moments to where, sure, we could have ended up with a dog aggressive dog and we have before and we do the best we can. But this dog would have died in that shelter and she was labeled a certain label um, where no other rescue wanted to touch her because it was a liability. And all we saw was an opportunity to make this dog's life better. And I just, she just will always have a special place in my heart because she, and the senior dogs alone, the team and I have such a soft spot for senior dogs to give yeah. them the best rest of their life that they can. Yeah. So it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing how animals Become less aggressive when you feed them, and you, you know, and you Absolutely. treat them. Feel safe. Shocking. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so how about you, Fatima? Um, what would you like to share with us? Yeah, <clears throat> like, I know I mentioned Bubba last time that we were speaking on the phone. And I just, after that conversation that we had, I just took a step back. And sometimes, and I always, I was always so proud of myself that I always remembered every dog, every name, every adopter. <laughs> but the, as the years go by and the numbers get bigger, I'm struggling. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going, this is like more of a, I chose him because it's like a resilient story. And where he is now is one of the great, a great ending, but a dog's name, Archie. Yeah. So Archie was a dog that we rescued off the side of the road. But when I tell you this story, you're going to be like, what? That wasn't even supposed to meant to happen. Mm -hmm. So when I mentioned earlier about what is the percent, like when we see a dog that's dying and we somehow end up crossing pathways, you're talking about the percentage of like how lucky this dog and us, we get to experience their transformation is. When we talk about Archie, he is literally one of the luckiest dogs that you you can think about. So we have a I have a I have multiple volunteers in Mexico. Volunteers; these are not people that make money at all. They literally live in a third world country and they work for day to day essentials, right? But they also love dogs, and I've created this incredible, this beautiful community of volunteers in Mexico that are literally there for the dogs. So this volunteer, her name is Judica. Her and her husband were driving back into Baja from a trip that they had made. And they're one of the sweetest couples that you will ever meet. I can sit there and talk to them for hours. And they were driving back. And Judica is always looking for dogs. That's her thing. She's always <laughs> looking for dogs to help, especially on the highway where it's like, you can't, there's no water anywhere. There's cars going in and out so she's always on the lookout even when we're in Mexico and driving to Rosarito we're always like just in case and she they were going like 60 miles per hour trying to get home because they have 20 dogs of their mm -hmm. own and she said from the corner of her eye she just when she turned around she saw a head poke mm -hmm. up but poked down at the same time literally she goes it was maybe one mm -hmm. second mm -hmm. and she said I told Arturo her husband we have to turn around she goes, even if it wasn't anything, let's turn around. He turned around and they started going down where she thought she saw the dog. She pulled over, they pulled over, they went to look and all of a sudden they see an air pop up from, <laughs> this was on a highway where it's like on a hill mm -hmm. and there was like a mountain of, of like dirt that he poked the set. And that's where you see his air pop up. And then they run, there's this beautiful, oh, I'm going to cry. <laughs> there's this beautiful dog and he has he can't get up because he got hit by a oh. car and he has this three fractions and and she literally called me she goes please and i'm like yes go ahead and there's this video of him just being carried oh. like <laughs> from the dirt into the car and his tail is oh. wagging and you're like oh my god yeah. <laughs> like where, how yeah and we brought him in and this dog had one of the toughest recoveries mm -hmm. ever. Like he literally had to get three legs like operated mm -hmm. on. He was in cast for months. We had Sharon, one of our fosters, took him in literally in a, in two seconds. And she said, "Bring him to my house." We got the surgery done. Then we found of uh, the volunteer. Her name is. Oh, sorry. Her name is Natalie. Natalie was fostering where else for a while and she saw Archie and she goes, I'll take him. She ended up foster failing him. And to see him in a family with Natalie and her husband and where they are, where they live, what he does on a daily basis is absolutely incredible. Yeah. But like I said, like we weren't supposed to we I don't know how the universe came together. Yeah. Yeah. We got to somehow spot his like little face, just like that last probably last energy that he had to please poke out for help. And it was her and she knew us and we knew Sharon. We knew Natalie, people that were going to come into his life and completely mm -hmm. change it. And it just happened. And it was yeah. That's amazing. That's so amazing. Just the universe really does step in to help animals, yeah. I think. And where people have failed so many of them, <laughs> the universe does try to make it better. So thank cool. you both for sharing those stories and for everything you do. And I would love for you to 
share with all of our listeners all your socials, your website, how people can donate to you. And just remember everybody who's listening, um, they're not pulling a salary. These are all volunteers. The more you can donate, the better. Yeah, go ahead and share all that information with us. Yes, we have a monthly donor program called TCF Angels. It's, some, you can, it's like a recurrent donation. You can find that through our, web, our website, thecantofoundation.org. There's also ways to give us like a one-time donation through Venmo, PayPal, Zelle. Our Venmo is at the Cantu Foundation. Our Zelle is connected to our email, thecantufoundation at gmail.com. And PayPal, PayPal has a little bit of a longer name, but all of the ways to donate is literally through our Instagram. If you click on the link on our bio, all the options will pop up. And any donation that you make is tax deductible because we are a nonprofit. So yeah, and if you can't donate truly, like we mentioned, social media plays such a huge role in how we grew and where we are. It's sharing, whether it's liking, commenting, sharing one of our posts of a dog. You never know who's going to see it. And this happened multiple times where we get a message saying, hey, my friend saw what I shared and she's applying. And then that adoption works. You truly never know. Uh, so sharing, whether <clears throat> it's not a, like be obsessively sharing if you want to, but story here and there commenting tagging it's it, it makes a big difference in social media and in the grand scheme of things in my opinion uh, and if in that's something that literally from home you can do if you're based in san diego we're always looking for volunteers at events transporting from the foster's homes to the events and i think that plays a huge role on how we're able to give our dogs another platform apart from social media in San Diego, in person. Okay. I want to thank Fatima and Jenna so much for your time, for everything you do, for the lives that you save. I I just really appreciate you both. Um, definitely check out the socials, Instagram, come to on wheels that I have subscribed to <laughs> and just thank you again so much. I will include all of this information in the show notes as well. And thank you to the two of you taking your time to talk about our rescue and all our amazing volunteers that truly make it. What yeah, it is. absolutely. Yeah. Shout out to the volunteers. So thank you so much. <laughs>